everyone. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind you to please silence your phones and mine's silent now. Uh, today is Thursday, April 13th, 2017. It's 1230, and this is panel number 4450, entitled the Howard Higman Memorial Plenary, The View from Hanoi. In this conference world fair session, we will be utilizing both the CWA app and a note card system to receive questions from the audience. To ask a question in the app, simply select this session in the schedule, tap live question and answer, and then insert your question, and it will come to my phone. Um, you may also raise your hand at any time to request a note card and pencil from one of our producers, then give your question to the producer. Uh, also, if you're a student, please note this in your question. So if you send me a, student, a question as a student, just type in student and then the question. Um, so thank you for that. My name is Bert Covert. I'm a professor of anthropology here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I've had the good fortune of conducting research on primate ecology and biodiversity conservation in Vietnam for the past 20 years. And I've long enjoyed the views from both Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. I've had the great pleasure of being a Fulbright Scholar on a couple of occasions, uh, and also a recipient of the Vietnam Education Foundation. And um, I truly love my uh, time in Vietnam. Uh, today it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce our speaker for this session, the U.S. Ambassador of Vietnam, Mr. Ted Osius. You've all had the chance to read the biographic sketch in the program, so I'll simply note that Ambassador Osius has degrees from Harvard and Johns Hopkins. His previous State Department appointments include the UN, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Korea. That's not an exhaustive treatment, but some examples. He was appointed ambassador to Vietnam in late 2014 and has previous experience in Vietnam in the late 1990s. I interact with the embassy and consulate personnel in Vietnam annually, and I have heard only praise uh, about Ted as the ambassador to Vietnam. And not only is he well respected by his US colleagues, he is also very well respected by the citizens of Vietnam. I have heard a range of compliments, but one of the most noteworthy is regarding his excellent command of the Vietnamese language. Vietnamese colleagues love that about Ambassador Osius. He's also sometimes referred to as the biking ambassador in Vietnam in reference to the fact that he's bicycled across this great Southeast Asian country. And um, this suggests to me that he would fit well in our bike-loving community here in Boulder. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Ted Osius to the Conference on World Affairs in the University of Colorado Boulder. Thank you. Thank you, Bert, and thank you to the Conference on World Affairs for inviting me to, to, to come here and to speak. Among other things, it's given me an opportunity uh, to see my sister, who's a Colorado native, uh, and some very, very dear friends, uh, and to enjoy the hospitality of uh, wonderful people in Boulder. So it's really, it's really fun to be here. And I did get a chance to hike this morning, and on the trail I discovered a rattlesnake. And I thought, I am back in the United States. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's not too much to say that right now the relationship with Vietnam is surging. We had last spring a, a wonderful visit from uh, President Barack Obama, and I had accompanied Bill Clinton about 16 years prior. And I remember when I was with President Clinton uh, going through the streets of Saigon, I kept looking out, and I, I would see everywhere I looked, people were lining the streets about six deep. Well, this time, coming in from the airport, uh, from Tansonyet Airport downtown, Everywhere I looked, it was about 30 people deep. There were a million people who turned out to greet President Obama in Ho Chi Minh City. And the uh, president said to me it was the biggest, warmest reception he had received anywhere in seven and a half years uh, as president traveling. And uh, prior to that, and actually subsequent, we were able to bring to the United States the number one uh, official of the Communist Party, that was in uh, 2015, and then late last year, the number two official in the Communist Party. That had never happened before. So the relationship is surging, and not just in terms of high-level visits, but we're interacting 
in ways that we never have before. But of course, we've just had a leadership transition in Washington. The Vietnamese have just had a leadership uh, transition themselves. And so what I think is right now, it's more important than ever to keep the lines of communication open. When it became clear that the United States would withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade agreement, that was all anybody in Vietnam could, could, uh, uh, could talk about. And I, I, was, I had been involved in the negotiations for that agreement for the last two years, and I knew that many of Vietnam's leaders felt that they'd gone out on a limb to be part of the TPP. And I thought, well, there, it's going to be, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't start squawking and say, hey, we went out on a limb and you cut it off. But that is not what happened. Uh, Vietnamese are very, very pragmatic, and they want to continue to develop a relationship with us, to deepen a relationship with us. So instead of complaining, they have been very proactive in reaching out to the new administration, and they've signed a number of deals, some, one of which had been stuck for 10 years, another one had been stuck for three years. They're going ahead. They're saying, okay, we want to do business. Uh, the, the analogy I like to to use, and some of you have traveled to Vietnam quite a bit, when you, when you encounter Vietnam's traffic, you know, it's all those motorbikes are all heading in, in one direction, and none of those drivers look to the left, they don't look to the right, and they certainly don't look back. And that's kind of the way the Vietnamese are, leadership on down, always looking forward, always seeing what's possible uh, for the future. So what I have tried to, to uh, emphasize in my exchanges with the leadership and with the people since these political changes have occurred is that while policies might change, the fundamental interests of the United States in Vietnam have not changed. I think that Vietnam's and America's interests are more closely aligned than they ever have been. It remains in our mutual interest that we continue to work together on issues of security and to safeguard the freedom of navigation through the South China Sea. Uh, that, that is something on which our interests are very tightly synced up. It remains in our mutual interest to establish labor standards that make it possible for uh, Vietnam's uh, workers to have a fair shot and for our businesses to be work, uh, operating on, level, on a level playing field with other businesses. It remains in our mutual interest to continue to strengthen the people-to-people -people ties that, that hold up our relationship, to continue to strengthen the number of, uh, enhance the number of people who uh, study in each other's countries. When I, I find that when someone has studied in, an, in another's country, you have a friend for life. And those are the kind of relationships that I believe will uh, support the relationship and take it forward for a long, long time. And it remains in our mutual interest that we continue to pursue uh, the freer, freer and fairer trade uh, between our two countries. When I, when I first arrived, as Bert mentioned, I, I arrived in late 2014, and we held a conference uh, to talk about what we could do in the relationship. And my counterpart, the Vice Foreign Minister, said, you know what we want to do with this relationship? We want to go from just looking at each other, cooperating bilaterally, to going out together in the world, to regional and bilateral collaboration on issues that make a really big difference to the world. Now think about that. We were at war not that long ago. And here the Vietnamese is saying to us, we want to work together on peacekeeping. We want to work together on climate change. We want to work together to prevent pandemics, to work together on, on global health. And that's what we've been doing. The, the, uh, another thing that I think was surprising to me is to find out how welcome Americans are in Vietnam. 92% of Vietnamese, whether in the North or the South or whether young or old, 92% consider the United States their country's best friend. That's only 40 years after the war ended. Uh, it's, a, it's a country with a population of 93 million, one of the fastest growing economies in Asia. It has enormous potential for trade to, in, in order to, uh, potential to increase trade with the United States. And it's in fact the, the fastest growing export market 
uh, in the world for us of those over, of markets over a billion dollars. In the last two years, when U.S. exports to the rest of Asia were either flat or slightly down, and to the rest of the world were down 10 percent, our exports to Vietnam were up 77 percent. And so we're now exporting as much to Spain as to a mature trading partner, uh, to, to Vietnam as to a mature trading partner like Spain. And the Vietnamese have a growing middle class. I mentioned to someone just before this, 30 years ago, uh, the Vietnamese had half of their population under the poverty line, earning less than $2 a day. Today it's 3%. So they've eliminated, for the most part, eliminated poverty, and they're very fast growing middle class. That middle class uh, is very much interested in enhancing ties to the United States, and looking at American brands and sending their kids to American schools, traveling to the United States. And those are the th exchanges that really, really open up a relationship. When you can expand that aperture and have more tourists traveling between the two, two countries, more students, more business people, that's when you really can build a strong relationship. I mentioned education a couple of times. When I think about American exports, there's none I'm prouder of than American education. We, of course, have the, the strongest higher education system in the world. And there are now 21,000 Vietnamese in, uh, in, uh, enjoying higher education in the United States, and 28,000 if you include high school students. That's up from, when I first went to Vietnam, about 800. So it's been a rapid, rapid increase in the number of, uh, of students who are coming here because this is, this is where they look. When, they, when young people in Vietnam consider what's possible for them in the future, when their country is integrating with the rest of the world, they don't look to their northern neighbor as the source of hope. They don't think, oh, we really want to be repressed more, like the Chinese. They think, we want more opportunities. We want to engage, and they look to us with hope. I don't want to let them down. Those students, the... the, the 28,000 students who are in the United States, they contribute $700 million a year to the U.S. economy, and they support almost 10,000 jobs. And we're creating more educational opportunities in Vietnam. Uh, my host, Chuck Davis, was a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, we're bringing the Peace Corps to Vietnam in 2018. And those young people, anybody who knows the Peace Corps, knows that that's, that's the best of the best. Uh, those young people will come and they will engage with Vietnamese and show that Americans aren't that different and that our young people are just as interested in learning from Vietnam as Vietnamese are interested in learning from us. In addition, we're about to open a new world-class American-style university, Fulbright University Vietnam in Ho Chi Minh City, the former Saigon. And I think that is that's how you really, you really can make a relationship last for a long, long time. The, the Vietnamese higher education system needs a lot of help. And if we are, are educating 4,500 students a year in an American-style university, and they're exchanging, they're, that university is having uh, exchange with other Vietnamese universities, and is transparent, and is showing what it's like to have academic freedom, and have students ask questions, uh, and not just learn by rote, but ask questions, that changes, uh, uh, changes a relationship, it changes a country. So I'm very excited about that project. We're also deepening our security partnership with Vietnam. And you might ask, well, how could we, a country that fought against Vietnam, have such a, a close security relationship to begin with? Well, we're, the Vietnamese are doing more with us than with anybody else and they look to us for uh, helping ensure stability in the South China Sea, helping ensure that sea lanes remain open. That's been a vital interest for us for 241 years, uh, and it's uh, an existential issue for, for Vietnam. We are expanding our partnership on uh, how to deliver humanitarian assistance and how to deal with natural disasters. We do a lot of that through the military and also through civilian organizations. And I, what I see is that what that 
Vice Foreign Minister had suggested. What we learn then is translated into what Vietnam can do with its neighbors, with the nations of ASEAN, in dealing with uh, humanitarian crises or natural disasters. This year is a special year in the relationship because Vietnam is the chair of APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, and will be hosting throughout the year leaders from 21 member economies, uh, culminating in a summit in November. But in the meantime, uh, trade ministers, finance ministers, high-level officials are traveling to Vietnam, and the Vietnamese have been very smart. Not only are they holding these meetings in the two big cities, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, but also in some of the second, secondary cities, Da Nang, Nha Trang, uh, Can Thơ, Ha Long Bay. And that is what they're able to do is show off the dynamism of their economy, the dynamism of their people to new U.S. administration and to the leaders of the other uh, 20 APEC uh, economies. Now, even as we agree on a large uh, set of priorities, economic priorities and security priorities, we also have to be honest about where we differ. And I think that's part of being a good partner. Uh, honest partners have to speak truth to one another. And so we continue to engage the Vietnamese in what I find to be the most difficult area for engagement, uh, human rights. So we work uh, very hard to, uh, to to promote freedom of expression, uh, to, de to uh, humane dealing with political dissent, and an independent press. And we work very hard on uh, promoting freedom to worship. And as someone who has watched this relationship now for 22 years, there's some very good trends. There's some things that are going not in a good direction. But there are also some very good trends. And I would just tell you a brief story when I was a when I opened that consulate that Bert mentioned, uh, I, I went up to the Central Highlands, and I, vi I visited a seminary, and it was a great big seminary, and there were three old monks in this enormous, enormous building, all over 70, and they were complaining about the fact that they couldn't educate new seminarians, couldn't bring in new people. Well, I went back as ambassador to the same seminary, and it was older monks, middle-aged monks, young monks, people going back and forth between seminary school in Yatrang and, and that seminary. And there were 150 ethnic minority kids running around and, and studying there. So there's been a lot of progress in opening up space for religious institutions to educate, to help the poor get access to, to health care. And I think we need to acknowledge progress where it exists. The other big difference from when I was there 22 years ago is that there's the internet. There are 48 million Vietnamese on Facebook. There are over 50 million who use the internet every single day. And I, I have, uh, I guess the embassy in, in all has about 450,000 Facebook followers. And I have 84,000 on my page. So I can read every day what people are thinking. I don't have to, I don't have, to have it filtered. And I can reach right out to people uh, over the heads of the government, which they don't always like. Uh, but I, I can really, it's a two-way, it's a two-way dialogue. I hear what people are thinking, and they hear what we're thinking. Now, uh, one last topic, and then we'll go to uh, discussion, and that is reconciliation. Our two governments have come a very long way in just over 20 years. Some brave people took up the cause of normalizing relations, people like Senator John Kerry and Senator John McCain, uh, and people like Everett Alvarez, who spent nine years in prison in Hanoi, but was a champion for normalization uh, of relations between our two nations. So now our two governments have a fully normal relationship. But our people, not yet. The, and, I under, and I understand this. I've had a chance to go to many parts of the country where there are concentrations of Vietnamese Americans. And there are many people who have very painful memories. And of course, there are a lot of US veterans who have very painful memories. The, these are people who, who suffered terribly because of the war. And Vietnamese Americans uh, have often you know, said to me, how can, you, how can you work in a country that has this flag? We fought and died for a country with a different flag. 
And what I have tried to stress is that it's like that, that example I gave you. The Vietnamese people are looking forward. They're not looking behind when they ride on their motorbikes. We have to look forward too and have to think about how the young people in Vietnam today might have opportunities that their parents and their grandparents never had. And so I went to one of the uh, kind of the toughest communities, uh, Houston, where, they, where there had been many calls for me to be withdrawn. And uh, they thought I was working too much uh, to, to bring our two countries together. And I, I told them what I've just told you about what I think the opportunities are. And they said, this is a uh, big gathering of old, uh, middle age, older, middle-aged, younger Vietnamese. And at the end of, end of this discussion, one of the older uh, members who had clearly had a, had a very, very hard time during the war and lost family members and had spent time in a re-education camp. He, deep very, he sighed very deeply and said, Ambassador, how can we help? And I think the way to help is to provide different opportunities for those young people, to show those young people that it doesn't have to be the way it was in the past. So that's what we've been trying to promote, is some kind of reconciliation between the more than two million Americans of Vietnamese origin and the people who live in their homeland. And I think that if, if we can continue to move in the direction where I see things headed now, that creates an, another set of opportunities uh, to strengthen a, a relationship with an old adversary and make sure that uh, we never go back in that direction but we provide opportunities for both nations. I think we can show a lot to the world when we show how two former adversaries can become such close partners. So thanks very much for your attention. I would very much enjoy uh, having a discussion and answering any questions that you might have. Thanks. So there's been a series of really good questions come in, and I'll get to them in a minute. Um, I want to start off by asking um, the Ambassador a couple of questions myself. Uh, I first went to Vietnam in 1998, so just a year or two after you did, and I fell in, fell in love with Hanoi within a day or two. Um, I knew I would enjoy it, I liked to travel, but the, how much people welcomed me really was amazing. Uh, on one of my first visits, I was able to give a lecture at the Hanoi University of Science to um, a series of senior students in biology. And since that time, I've seen these kids become young adults, graduate from college, uh, some of them get advanced degrees abroad, and now they're all in the middle class that's emerged. And what's been most amazing to me, not most, my favorite thing I've seen in Vietnam since 1998, and I've gone back each year, is there's a middle class that has merged and the, these young families have the same hopes and aspirations of my own children. They want their kids to get a good education, they want their kids to have opportunity, and they see this as a possibility today, which I think maybe they wouldn't have in 1998. So my first question is, um, you mentioned some of these things in your talk, but is there one or two things that really stand out, um, changes since 1997 in your mind? I mean, the two, the two biggest things that stand out for me are the phenomenal prosperity that now exists. Here's a country that in 30 years has gone from 50% of the people below the poverty line to only 3%, where there are, you know, there's a very, very, there's a well-to-do middle class. There are people not just flowing to the cities, actually people in the countryside doing very well also. So the increased prosperity is is big. It's, Vietnam had the, has had the highest growth rates in the world, except for China. Second, so the second highest growth rates in the world over a 30-year period. That I think is pretty astonishing, and that's changed the options that uh, Vietnamese have. And then the second thing that has really floored me, and I mentioned it, is the internet and how plugged in young Vietnamese are. So that's why they have those young people have the same aspirations that your kids do because they see what's happening in the world and they, they want to be part of it. 
And for, for seven or eight years, the, the stated policy of the Vietnamese government has been comprehensive international integration. And that means not just trade, but also how do you, how do you take the best from the world? How do you learn lessons from the rest of the world and apply them to Vietnam's own challenges? Uh, and I think it's, it's quite inspiring. I would like to just keep on talking with Ted, just the two of us for the next 20 minutes, but one last question, then I'll get to your questions. Um, President Obama is a rock star in Vietnam with my colleagues. And when he was there, he had the opportunity to go out for dinner with Tony Bourdain and had some bún cha, one of my favorite dishes in Vietnam. What's your favorite Vietnamese cuisine? I really love bánh xèo. Uh, bánh xèo is in the, in the south. Um, it's, a, it's a really great street food, and it has bean sprouts and sometimes pork, and sometimes it has a lot of different things in it. But it's cooked right on the street very often, or the best bánh xèo is. And I love that. And our, we, it's, it's a southern dish, but I can find really good bánh xèo in Hanoi as well now. And I just love it. It's interesting you mentioned that. I'll be arriving in Ho Chi Minh City on the evening of May 19th, and uh, I imagine having some um, bánh xèo the next day. So, that's a... so again, uh, I feel incredibly lucky to be sitting up here with Ted, and let me go ahead and pull up some of these questions. And a number of excellent questions have come in here. They keep on coming in. That's a good sign. Mm -hmm. So what do we import and export um, to and from Vietnam? You mentioned they're one of our big trade partners. So we export, you, you might be surprised by this, but we export an enormous amount of agricultural products to Vietnam. So we export soybeans, uh, meat and dairy products, fruit and nuts. More than half of our exports to Vietnam are agricultural exports. And for those uh, politicians out there, they come from red states. Uh, those exports come from red states. So it's not just blue states that have an interest in enhancing this trade relationship. Um, we also, we're, we, we have an uh, advantage when it comes to service exports. And the one I'm proudest of is the one I mentioned, which is the export of education. Um, but we also export uh, financial services, uh, other, other services. The Vietnamese export to us, exports to us are mostly uh, low-tech. So shoes, textiles, clothing and apparel, uh, shrimp, catfish. Uh, I, I got in a lot of trouble with one of, one of the senators because he didn't like how much we imported uh, catfish, and he held up my confirmation for six months. But we, the, the, uh, I mean, the fact is it's a, uh, it's a very dynamic trade relationship, a growing trade relationship. But what the Vietnamese don't want is to be kind of stuck in a situation where they, they constantly have a trade deficit with China and constant trade surplus with us. They want to balance this out, and they want to move up the value chain. Their, their blueprint is right there on the web. It's, it's interesting for a communist country that they've put in a report, a government report that they did with the World Bank, Vietnam 2035, their aspirations for the future, which is to move from being a lower middle income class, a lower middle income country to an upper middle income country by 2035. How do you do that? You have to move up the value chain. There has to be more IT. You have to be employing young people in uh, some of our companies that are already there, like, uh, like uh, Google, Facebook, Intel. Um, but um, also it requires a more open and innovative educational system. So the aspirations that the Vietnamese have, uh, uh, I think, are ones that, where we can be very, very helpful, because a more innovative and open educational system is in their interest, and it's in our interest to be able to show some of the ways to do that. Thank you. Um, here's a question from a student. You mentioned how Vietnamese look to the U.S. as a source of hope for expanding stability and freedom. Do you think this has changed with the current administration? Why or why not? Again, I will come back to that analogy. The Vietnamese are looking forward. They expected Hillary Clinton to win, and she didn't. So inst instead of looking back, they have been saying, well, how can we build ties to the new administration? And people were worried that the number of students 
from Vietnam would go down as a result of some of the policies that have been enunciated by the new administration, but that has not been happening. So we've been hosting educational fairs in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been showing up, more than ever before. So I think the, there are going to be concerns particularly about trade. I think especially if we address those head on, we're going to be able to continue to build this partnership. Thanks. The questions are coming in fast and furious here. Good. Um, How do you explain absence of bitterness of Vietnamese towards Americans? Well, it's quite phenomenal. When I was first there, now almost 22 years ago, I did a bike ride, and this was a lot closer to the end of the war. I did a bike ride from uh, Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City. And in the middle, in the DMZ, I was on a bridge. It's a bridge that used to divide the north and the south. And I stopped and I was looking out over the landscape and there were all these ponds. Uh, and I asked a woman who was next to me, so what is with uh, all of these ponds? And she said, well, those are bomb craters. Those are where Americans drop bombs on us. And then she started to tell me about the number of family members she'd lost. And I was kind of sinking lower because uh, uh, I represent the United States. I'm not I wasn't just a tourist passing through. I work for the US government. And so I told her that. And she, uh, she rep replied to me in Vietnamese, Hôm nay chúng ta là chị em. Vietnamese language is very familial. You don't just say you. You always describe relationships in terms of where you are in the family. She was saying, you and I are older sister, younger brother. So uh, that's, not a, that's an anecdotal answer. I guess a, a, probably a more comprehensive answer is Vietnam has very seldom known peace. Really the first time that, that nation knew peace was 1992 after a 12 year war with China. People forget that the 1979 war with China lasted from 79 to 91 and people were killed in large numbers every year. Before that there was a thousand years fighting China for independence. And then the Vietnamese fought the French for a half a century seeking independence. Then they fought the Japanese, then they fought the French again. Then they fought us. Then they fought Cambodia. Then they fought the Chinese. There has, they have not known a period free of conflict until 1992. And so I think if they were constantly dwelling on the past, they never get anything done, but that is not who they are. Vietnamese people are looking forward and, and uh, ready to forgive. You know, I have a very sobering conversation when I first arrived in Vietnam in 1998. Uh, my host was um, the director of the Geology Museum in Hanoi, and he was a veteran of the Northern Army. And um, talking to him about issues and um, being sympathetic to his situation, having lost a number of his family members. He talked about looking back at the U.S. war, not in a romantic sense, but he said, you know, the, the U.S. were worthy adversaries. And um, to me, that was a puzzling attitude um, that, because of warfare. But then he went on to talk about um, his friends who fought um, liberating Cambodia from the Khmer Rouge, and just a different type of engagement, and also the history with the Chinese. Um, Another question here is, I don't have to look at it, uh, what's Vietnamese re Vietnam's relationship with North Korea? That's what I've been asked a lot lately. Uh, the, the, they there's a very traditional ideological relationship with North Korea. So the Workers' Party, Korean Workers' Party and the Vietnamese Communist Party have had long ties and they've had back and forth party to party relations for a long time. But today there are 40,000 South Koreans in Hanoi and 100,000 South Koreans in Ho Chi Minh City. South Korea is the biggest investor in Vietnam, biggest foreign investor in Vietnam, followed by Japan and then probably followed by us. And so the Vietnamese have much more interest, real interest in a relationship with South Korea. So when uh, recent events occurred, a, the son of the North Korean ambassador to Vietnam lured a girl, a young girl, from 
Ninbin province into this assassination plot in, uh, in Malaysia, where they used, I think, sarin gas or uh, a, a, a weapon of mass destruction was used to assassinate this uh, half-brother of Kim Jong-un. That made the Vietnamese really mad. They felt that their hospitality had been abused by the North Koreans. And so I feel like right now that relationship is probably as bad as it's ever been. And they're, you know, they look at their interests and they look at how the North Koreans are abusing their hospitality and they're really angry and they are sh they're thinking about ways that they can effectively show that. And I've got the next cards here also, so I'll be equal opportunity question. Um, please discuss freedom of expression slash censorship history and now in Vietnam. So there are two parts to that. Um, the media is controlled. So I know that whatever I read in the newspaper has been approved and uh, editors have gone, they go in every Saturday or whatever it is and they get instructions, this is what you're allowed to print and these are lines you should not cross. But the internet is a whole different beast and people say whatever they want on the internet. I'm astonished, you know, someone who was there 22 years ago, I was astonished when I came back and I saw that people would criticize, the government criticized people in any way they felt they felt they could. And I think the approach to the, by the authorities has been, well, we don't particularly like this, but we really want to be engaged in the world. And you can't turn off the internet. And they haven't done what China has done and cut off Facebook and closed down big swaths of the internet. Occasionally they will object about content on YouTube or, or some other uh, way that people are expressing themselves. Um, but in general, they've just decided, you know, we have to live with this. And the last prime minister gave a speech in which he said, cadres, you're going to see things on the internet that you don't like. Counter them with facts. Not shut them down. Counter them with facts. That's kind of what a lot of other countries do uh, with the internet. So what I see is an ex ever-expanding are ever-expanding opportunities for freedom of expression. Now, that isn't to say there aren't setbacks. The, there have been bloggers who've been arrested for saying what they want because they, the government felt that they crossed a line. And we speak out and we try to get them out of jail or, or, or get them, if they're in pretrial detention, get them released. Um, but it's, it's an ongoing struggle. The, because of the, the history that I mentioned, all of those conflicts, the leadership in Vietnam is very invested in stability. They've, war after war after war, they want stability. And when they see big protests or uh, things that might translate into movements that might under, undermine the party, they tend to react rather harshly. But when they feel that stability isn't threatened, they kind of let it go. You're talking about the internet in Vietnam, that cell coverage in Vietnam is quite a bit better than the cell coverage in the United States. Uh, and I, uh, I spend a lot of time in very rural areas of Vietnam, and I can pull out my smartphone and email my dean at University of Colorado Boulder, and she often responds that I'm the first to respond to one of the emails she sent out late in the afternoon, so she's on 13 hours ahead. Um, but the, the average Vietnamese person carries two cell phones with him or her, and they're online all the time. 110 million cell phones in a nation of 93 million. So here's a question that I could have written, but I didn't. Um, is the government doing anything to help remediate the air pollution? Can we, U.S., help in any way? So I don't know, the Vietnamese government? I think we actually can help. We, put, we have two monitors, in, uh, that in, uh, monitors for what's happening in the air that people watch in real time on the internet that says exactly what the quality of the, of the air is every day. And people go to our monitors rather than Vietnamese government monitors because ours are more accurate. And so we've been, that's been the kind of the first effort is to put it out there how much, how serious the problems are with regard to air pollution. And the other thing we're doing, and I can't take credit for this, this is really the U.S. business community. The U.S. business community has put out something called the Made in Vietnam Energy Plan. And they've pointed out to Vietnamese leaders that if they s stick to the current trajectory, they will go from 19 coal power plants to 53 
by 2030. And that, you know, these, all these plants will be belching out uh, uh, terrible, terribly dirty air, and it will uh, harm the, the health of Vietnamese. And the coal comes from China, also from Australia and Indo Indonesia. But if the Chinese are providing the coal, they can also cut off the coal. So it's a, it's a challenge to Vietnam's energy security to be so dependent on coal. And so the business community has said, look, you can do much more with renewables. And companies like GE are heavily invested in wind turbines. Companies like AES are investing in solar energy, especially in the central highlands. And then natural gas, which is not perfect, but it's way, way, way better than coal. And so, so the Vietnamese can increase their energy security. They can uh, have much, much cleaner energy and they don't have to uh, depend on others uh, to, to provide that energy. I've received more than 70 questions now, so we're not gonna get all of them, but... Um, I'll give you shorter answers if um, that helps. There's a lot of overlap. Uh, as a former Peace Corps volunteer, I'm interested in knowing what new volunteers will be doing as Peace Corps begins in Vietnam. Uh, the, the Peace Corps will start with probably about, a group of about 20, and they'll start in Hanoi, and uh, the agreement is for uh, both secondary schools and universities for them to teach, and it's just going to be English teaching, to start out just English teaching, because that's the, that's the way, I think, to introduce the Peace Corps. Um, I, and again, a little anecdote, I know my answers are too long, sorry, uh, but in Indonesia, uh, I, we introduced the Peace Corps, brought the Peace Corps, we were told, can never have the Peace Corps in Indonesia, and once we'd had Peace Corps volunteers there for, for just over a year, I had governors coming to me and saying, why only 70 volunteers? We want 2,000. This is what happens when people experience the Peace Corps and what it does. They start to really be advocates. So the suspicions that have existed up till now, I think will evaporate and people will see the Peace Corps for what it is, a wonderful program. And your answers are not too long. They're most excellent. Um, is Vietnam a good comparison of the effectiveness of economic development versus military might? Um, if so, where should we apply these learnings? To, to ourselves? You know, it's, it's a question came out of my phone here. So, um, so Vietnam has had incredibly rapid economic development over the last 15 years. Um, how much have they been investing in the military during that time period? Oh, well, not quite as much as we have. Uh, the, the, they, ha they do have a robust military, uh, and we've actually been working with that military to make sure that they have the capabilities to see what's happening in their own territorial waters. Um, but the, there's a lot of the investment in Vietnam has been in kind of in the basics, in health, and in education, in infrastructure. Uh, so I think that they've been trying to get their emphasis is on development. It's always been on development. Military holds a special place, and the military, uh, to be, to be uh, uh, stark about it, a little bit blunt about it, the military also owns a lot of companies. Military gets a lot of its revenue from state-owned enterprises. And so, uh, and those aren't necessarily the best-run uh, state-owned enterprises, but part of the reason that not a huge amount of the government coffers goes to the military is that they've got their own industries. I've stayed in the Army Hotel in Hanoi, and uh, one of our conservation pro uh, projects in Ken Yang, one of our biggest challenges is uh, military-owned uh, concrete manufacturing firms. So, um, a recurring theme, about a, a 10 questions, or short questions. How about human rights? Uh, you mentioned in your talk there's some challenges there. Well, there really are challenges. Uh, I mean, I try to look at the trends as well as the individual cases, and the trends are, are good. The trends when it comes to religious freedom are very good, and uh, the trends when it comes to prisoners of conscience are okay. There, the, there are fewer prisoners of conscience in jail now than there were when I arrived, and I intervene on individual cases all the time. But what, I'm, what I've been finding, and I think my predecessor found this as well, is that if you know, you're just focused on individual cases, then they'll let somebody out of prison in time for uh, a visit to make the visit a little bit better, 
but someone else will get thrown into prison right behind them. That is not a good dynamic, and it's not one that improves our relationship. So what we have really focused on are Vietnamese aspirations themselves. The Vietnamese adopted a new constitution in 2013, which calls for freedom of worship, freedom of expression, uh, uh, freedom, but it calls for, it refers to democracy and the need for, demo, for a more democratic society. And so they're systematically syncing up their laws with that constitution. So what we've tried to do is provide technical support, not ideological guidance, not finger wagging, but technical support so that the, as they synchronize those laws, they do so in a way that really respects their aspirations. So the new law on religion and belief is a huge step in the direction of creating more space for religious institutions. And that's partly because we worked with them through 19 drafts, if I recall correctly. And we brought people from, uh, from U.S. universities, we brought experts, uh, lawyers, to help to work on those drafts. And the way I try to put it with the Vietnamese is this is all about your success. We're not interested in undermining Vietnam. We're not interested in destabilizing Vietnam. We're very much interested in its success. Our mantra is the United States supports a strong, prosperous, independent Vietnam that respects the rule of law and human rights. And it, those two things balance one another in a way. There are those two uh, f aspects of our policy. And so what we, we try to do is provide the support which helps them achieve their own aspirations. And I think that's way more effective than lecturing and saying, do it the way we do. We've only got two or three more minutes. And again, I apologize for all those people. I couldn't get to your questions. A question just came in that um, I think will address issues of the Conference on World Affairs maybe more broadly. Uh, what's been your greatest challenge being a diplomat? And, and do you have any advice for getting into foreign service? This is from a CU alumnus who failed the foreign service exam. <laughs> uh, well, this is a career that I have loved. I've been doing this for uh, 28 years, and, and, and I found I've never had a dull day. No, it's, it's really interesting to, to uh, represent one's own country overseas. The biggest, one of, one of the biggest challenges is that I don't always agree with all of my instructions. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, and there was a time, actually not now, there was a time uh, a few years ago when I was working on Korea policy and I was very frustrated. I thought our policy was very wrong. And I had two choices. I could keep going and keep fighting for what were the best policies or I could quit because we're not allowed to, you really can't freelance as a U.S. diplomat. It just doesn't work that way. And so uh, I decided not to quit. I respect those who, who, for reasons of conscience, say, look, I'm not going to cross that line. I can't continue to do this job. Um, but I decided to stay in, and I'm really glad that I did. Uh, now, since we've had a big political change in our country, a lot of my, the people who work for me have asked, well, how do I reconcile uh, what I believe with what I'm uh, being asked to do in some cases. And I say, well, don't do anything that does violence to your core beliefs. Do not, because you lose your soul if you do that. Uh, but I also remind my, my colleagues, we swore an oath to the U.S. Constitution, not to any individual, not to any party. We swore an oath to uphold the Constitution. And as long as we can do that, as long as we can keep making a difference, in relationships uh, with our friends, with our partners, with our allies, then we should keep doing it. And if we find that we can't, then we should do something else. Well, thank you. I want to thank the Conference on World Affairs for um, hosting this wonderful event. I want to thank Laura for being our producer. Um, great help today. Um, thanks to the people with the AV equipment good job, everything worked great, and a very special thanks to Ambassador Ted Osseus for coming and sharing uh, with us today that um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I hope you all have also. Thank you, Bert, and, and thank you to all of you for coming today. Thank you very much.